So good afternoon everyone or good morning wherever you are located uh, in the world. It's uh, a pleasure uh, to have you guys here and for whoever is also watching this later uh, for you take the time to have a look at this. I'm here with Sebastian Stadler, a PhD that worked for four years, correct? Yeah, almost four years. Almost four years at uh, uh, Tomb Create in Singapore and uh, explore the possibility of using a virtual reality uh, to uh, do design in a way, right? And uh, uh, to do user testing and then to explore how autonomous mobility could actually make a difference and um, could be used in Singapore with regards to different, uh, to, to different, let's say, application or different stage of the customer journey, so to say, right? And this is something that we're gonna uh, hear from uh, Sebastian. So maybe Sebastian, why don't you start giving us a little uh, like summary of what you are and how you ended up uh, in uh, virtual reality? All right, sure. First of all, thanks for having me. I'm very excited for, for this talk. Um, my name is Sebastian, as you already introduced. I am a trained industrial designer. Um, I graduated from the Technical University of Munich in 2016 with a master's degree. And I got offered a PhD position in Singapore at a research institute called Toon Create. And um, that's the reason why I went directly after my graduation to, to Singapore and started in this company as a research associate. And um, this also gave a little bit topic because the research institute I was working for, they were developing a autonomous public transport system for Singapore. And okay. therefore the, the, um, the scope of the project was already given. And um, from my professor, I already got like the um, the two major things that were interesting for my PhD project. The first was the tool of virtual reality to use that. And the second is my profession as a designer to bring that in. And therefore, after one and a half years, I'd say my, my topic evolved in this way that I investigated how designers, industrial designers can use the uh, technology of virtual reality throughout the design process, which means from the beginning when you um, identify problems, then um, generating concepts, evaluating concepts, and in the end, even presenting these concepts. And that's how I ended up here. Yeah, and, and indeed, usually very often that's what happened, right? During the PhD, the topic is kind of like a bit fluid right and, yeah. and and it's about trying also to find uh, to find kind of like your own way and i think also that something we're going to talk, to touch upon having like a designer that it's sometimes often associated with something that is very creative and, and it, it's very free form uh, does not match at first with the idea of designing something that is as mm. hard as mm. putting boxes coding interactions and so on right yeah so Maybe before we go into that shortly, what was the role in the bigger picture with regards to virtual reality and Tom Create? So what what was the plan there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So maybe I explain very shortly how Tom Create works. Um, it is a research institute where uh, over 100 researchers are constantly working on this concept of a public transport system that is level five autonomous. For people who don't know, that is uh, level zero is a car where you have to do anything by, by yourself as a driver. And level five autonomous vehicle means that in any circumstances, the system operates the vehicle and you as a person are in there as a passenger. There is not even a steering wheel anymore, nothing. Mm -hmm. So this is the level of autonomy we are talking there. Okay. And as we know it, um, I mean, there are some good concepts right now on the market, but they are still level two, maybe level three. So we are far away from this level five we were working with. However, um, we were governmentally funded, means it was always relevant for Singapore. And as you might know, Singapore is one of the biggest rising mega cities in Asia. They want to be the first in knowledge, in research, and therefore, for them, it was very interesting to step beyond this this current time of autonomy, but really like what would be the implementation case of autonomous vehicles in Singapore. And this is in this bed I fell into as a research associate. And um, this also gives a hint why we use virtual reality, because if you don't have a level five autonomous vehicle at hand, normally right now you don't have the, the technology point, yeah. um, so so you cannot 
conduct research or let's say uh, uh, scientific experiments with a autonomous vehicle because it is not there you would need to recreate a um, realistic traffic scenario where you would have to shut down a whole district in order to to see how the driving behavior works i have to say there that singapore is already on the way doing that there are some districts they want to keep open for autonomous vehicle research so mm -hmm. they are very far in this wow, procedure okay <laughs> However, it, it is not there yet. Yeah. We did not have the, the vehicle at hand. It, there's always a safety risk involved if you put passengers or pedestrians in an environment with autonomous vehicles. Yeah. And therefore, in my department, we were um, focusing on the user interaction between uh, pedestrians, passengers, let's say X, so vehicle to X with these autonomous vehicles. And therefore it was very um, near to use virtual reality because it was a way for us to make behavioral observations of people being immersed in VR and then actually reacting and behaving in an environment that was simulated to appear realistic to them. And therefore we could see how interaction techniques with these vehicles, for example, yeah. work. Oh, there is so much going on, you know, because one thing is about also like, uh, I always also really believe that we, one thing that we are allowed to do is test the impossible, right? Yeah. Because technically, that is what you do, right? Technically, if you can recreate what is that is not possible nowadays, and you mentioned like, yeah, there are no vehicles that work like that. But exactly. it's also the idea of this kind of like prototyping, right? So how can you test something when still doesn't exist? To then yeah. make assumption on, on how that should be designed differently, yeah. it's it's really really interesting because you can easily program how a, a, like in a way autonomous vehicle will behave uh, or simulate, uh, but certainly testing it it's a different story. And there was another what's a really interesting point that I'm, I'm curious to learn about is you mentioned about also like put people in a real environment. Now I'm also like what is real. Right. Oh, because, oh. <laughs> uh, that's almost philosophical. <laughs> no, no, but no, but because the point is, what is the minimum that is needed to to mm -hmm. do in order to trick our brain to get the specific responses that we need in order to gather the insights that yeah. that are important. So that that is actually. And let me also that chip one thing. Now we have uh, some people online, and if you do have questions regarding this, right, it could be about the project. It could be about some of the things that Sebastian is saying. I please, 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 please. Uh, I'm gonna cut. I'm gonna stop talking. I'm gonna cut Sebastian. No problem. I agree with him before. So yes. I've got his permission. <laughs> totally fine. <laughs> uh, but indeed. So please ask questions because it would really be uh, a pleasure to get this also a bit interactive. It's just want to be just me or him talking all the time. So. Yeah, uh, one thing, real. What is real? Yeah. That, that is actually a topic I discussed throughout the years very frequently with other researchers in the field of VR. Um, I can just share our experiences. I'm happy to know uh, or, or to learn about other, other mm -hmm. thoughts about this. But what we learned is it depends on the task that you have to fulfill within the environment. Mm -hmm. um, what we learned is if you have a simple task of, let's say, yes or no, people do not need a very realistic looking environment. So a very abstract one is also working quite well, let's say. So we had one scenario where you are a bicycle driver and you are approaching a junction with the traffic lights and uh, it was very boxy. We didn't have any textures on the walls. It was just boxes. And in the end, as a rider of this bicycle, you just had to decide whether you pass the junction or not, which for me is a yes or no uh, situation when there's a traffic light. Maybe there's a third option when it's the, the, the amber, the, the, the orange, but it is very clear. But what we tested here is how people behave in front of an approaching vehicle, which is not just like a yes or no, but it's like, what do they see? What do they interpret? How is the uh, driving behavior of the vehicle uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, changing their, their thoughts or their, their behavior? And there, what we found out is that a certain degree of, of realness in there is required that people feel they are immersed in this in this environment. If it is very boxy there, people also see it as boxy. And what we found out there is if it is um, a real or more real than the abstract scenario we had beforehand, 
it shows better reactions, let's say. And what do I mean by better reactions is also quite tricky, I would say. But what we had in one case is um, we let people pass a one-way road via a zebra crossing and autonomous vehicles were approaching. And um, what we observed, for example, is when people walked over the zebra crossing and mm -hmm. entered the sideway, uh, uh, sideway again, sidewalk, um, there's always this, this barrier, this hurdle they have to overstep. And even though in our lab there was not a barrier, of course, of this step, people started to attempt this high step. And even after figuring out that it is not there in the real world, they maintained this behavior until the end of the experiment, which showed us, okay, this degree of realness is enough for people to behaving in a similar way that they would do in a real world. Yeah, yeah. I think we've got here some amazing questions, Sebastian. Uh, so, for example, Marcus uh, asked, uh, real in which respect? Do we have to be real in every respect or just the most important one? My guess would be that it has, really has to do with the kind of prototype and the kind of like dimension of the, of the prototype or... Of, of fidelity, right? Because there is always yes. like visual fidelity, there is interaction fidelity, and, and there is more. So, uh, what and later on, uh, that relate also, we have a question from Meredith that says, like, how did you measure realness? I think those are kind of like very connected, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah, they're very connected. And um, I mean, research is also arguing about this you you cannot measure realness per se yeah. and you cannot say you need to achieve this realness in order to measure that 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 task it is i think more a a, a graduation which is defined by by outer aspects for example we knew we have this budget we have this kind of competency in the team and we have um this KPI to fulfill. And this already gives you the framework of what can you achieve. Do you know what yeah. I mean? So you have six months, you want to conduct these tests, you have a 3D visualizer and a, a developer on board, and then you try your best to make it as real as possible. And if you see, okay, we have the environment now, uh, you have the hardware that can render this in, in uh, sufficient FPS, then I think you try to achieve the best you can have, but you will not have a, a realness, that this one realness as you would stand in front of the vehicle once it is on the market. Yeah. But I also think that it would not be the same way if you conduct an experiment, because if people participate actively in an experiment, they already know that they are in a controlled environment that, and that normally nothing would happen to them. And this already, this, this, consciousness can already alter the behavior of people trying out new things therefore yeah. with realness even without the technology of vr it's always this question what what is real there yeah. or not because actually experiments already alter the realness yeah. there and i think that in a way also answered the question from marcus because he asked a follow-up question it's like did you validate that the simple models evoke the same reaction that in the real mo in the real world i think that this is also the moment where I mean, if you're testing the impossible, you cannot double check. I suppose that you should make a whole study just for that purpose, right? Exactly. And this, I believe, yes. was not really what you were after, at least in concrete. But I believe that there should be someone testing currently this. I believe that yes. there are, for example, people in Denmark that are, for example, doing also a very good job and that where their focus of research is not autonomous mobility, is not design, but is yeah. instead uh, in the, the, the VR. What, what yeah. does VR do? What is real? And then focuses maybe more on that philosophical question. Yeah. And also it depends on, on the case study, in my opinion. We validated for our case study that, uh, for example, the walking speeds in VR are similar to real life walking speeds, um, which means for this one case study, we could confirm for us that we believe to a certain degree there is this authentic behavior of people triggered by by some events but that doesn't mean if you go into a completely different field that people uh, uh, will react exactly the same way and yeah. this is always the question with this benchmark study you cannot say we make this one study and we can ensure now that every other study follow up in other application fields um, are authentic or trigger authentic behaviors before that
Yeah. So I also there was a question that goes more on the like the technology that you use, and this is I think offer a good bridge also between your role as a designer and you dealing with that technology. I think this could be very valuable. Uh, uh, Greg asks, um, do you use HMD controller for design while in VR or any other finger tracking solution? Mm, yeah, um, we were considering that quite frequently. So there is the leap motion, for example, uh, where you have the, the yeah, hand yeah, tracking yeah. immediately. Um, we used HMD input devices. So, so first of all, I have to say, we used HMDs, head-mounted displays, all the time because um, it was in, in a question of having a cave system, but we didn't have the budget. It is very expensive to order. It is also expensive to maintain. Therefore, we shut down and said, okay, it's just HMDs. And then we always tried to have a interaction that's as as simple as possible that uh, as many people as possible can inter interact with it but there we have the same thing depending on the case study for some case studies as we had it with this walking scenario um, it is easy we didn't even give people in input devices but they were just walking in this environment that we created to them therefore we could ensure okay they don't even have to actively interact with the system but we conducted other studies where people, uh, we created, for example, a configurator where people could design a public waiting room for transport, like a bus station. Yeah, yeah. And we had different um, properties like the room dimensions, the, the color textures on the wall and things like that. And there people had to interact. We used input devices there and we already figured out that there are some thresholds of people that can interact with the system. Um, also, we did. We created one um, VR prototyping tool similar to a CAD tool, where also you need, of course, the, the input devices. Um, we were also considering um, using for a driving simulator with the steering wheel leap motion then, yeah. but we decided against it um, based on literature. Um, so uh, literature suggests that it is not necessary, uh, not, not necessary in all the cases and it was also the way when when i then um, moved out of, of singapore and moved back and therefore i did not even finish this this one case study we were considering it but then um, we decided against it personally but but i would be always yeah, open yeah, yeah. to try it again in a new study and i think it really depends right i mean if you if you have something to do where hands could be a part of it then i think it makes sense to have a hand tracking but i yep. i'm not sure that always hand tracking might be the better solution to interact with a menu right because you might yep. think that it's all nice and intuitive but if if people twist their hand or they don't do it what are you going to do are you going to grab their waist no you should do it like this and do like this i mean exactly <laughs> so yes. this is yes. also like tricky and maybe something very simple that could be just a controller i found personally that sometimes uh, also the oculus controller could be overwhelming for people because there are just too many yeah. buttons uh, yeah but again yeah. those are all things that depend very um that uh that, that depend very much there was marcus also mentioned that there is a research about fidelity of ux prototype uh and what kind of feedback you get uh marcus i think you need to send me to the i don't know if this is the work from abdul from the university of Furtwagen that's what we're referring to if not please send it over to me because i'm uh, i'm curious uh <laughs> to get it um so you we there are a couple of times where this uh, this topic about this is our purpose this is our timing this is our resources uh we have to make choices right so there is yeah. a moment where we want to prototype the impossible but sadly we still are in the in, in, in the real world uh, so exactly. it, it's not a world where there is infinite budget so from a designer perspective right that, that has of course i wouldn't say a dream right but he has an ideal scenario that says, okay well i would like to do that what are the obstacles that you encountered when trying to come up with something that answered your own uh, that, that answer that specific research question, that specific test that you had in mind. What are the obstacles that you encountered when coming up with an experience? So overall, I can say for me, there was one big obstacle in every study that I did. And that's very easy. I'm a trained industrial designer. I had one uh, class during my master's studies where we learned prog programming. It was like the very basics. Mm -hmm. So I do not have the uh, competency for, for programming and I will never be a software developer. I don't want to be a software developer. And therefore, there was always the, the uh, dependency on other people. 
So we always had software developers in our team because the way I wanted to have this experiment and how, how we created this methodology, you would need a lot of experience in order to recreate these in a, in a game engine or, or a, whatever and therefore i didn't even start with doing that and i knew okay we have to outsource this and this means you always had to create a good working functioning team where you were more the coordinator as a designer so the the, the role of me as a designer in this project changed fundamentally because um as you already said earlier design everyone uh, associates it with with creative work with coming up with ideas with sketching and with this and i felt like my work at toon create was far away from that i was uh, an initiator of a uh, of a study i felt like okay from my phd study we have to make this and this project and then i was uh, thinking about okay what do you need to have as a competency on board? We always had a psychologist on board for the methodology. We had a 3D visualizer. Of course, I also work with, with CAD software and could provide the models, but outsourcing there is of course better for you that you don't have to actually do this, this executive work, but like coordinating more Management. than always. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> always at least one software developer. It is necessary, of course, to to know the, the, the logic of, of programming and also knowing how it works. And this is what I learned during my, my studies. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I talk their language. I can talk about problems, but I won't be the person who really sits there and codes the environment in Unity or, or Unreal or whatever. Yeah. And this was always the obstacle, no matter uh, with what study we did a lot of VR studies, we did also a MR study, um, and it was all the time the same. And this was the biggest hurdle, in my opinion. So basically, like getting access to developers that could create with you. And I'm, I'm curious, like personally, how would that feel? You know, because I'm, I'm, some, there are people that might be also feel frustrated a little, right? Um, one thing that it could be, oh, I'm a designer, I'm a person that should be creative, should get a feedback and should try to study the users and stuff like this. And uh, how was it from your perspective to actually look at uh, uh, this from a more management perspective in a way? So it's more like giving direction and letting people execute instead of mm -hmm. executing yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, actually, it was frustrating sometimes because... Um, in this project, what we did very frequently, for example, is we hired students and we supervised their master's thesis. Yeah. And for us, it started not with, hey, cool, I have an idea, I have this research questions, let's do this. No, it was bureaucracy in our institute to hire these people. So I was at the very back end and giving the way, giving like uh, the manpower here, yeah, the, the, the uh, man hours to be uh, uh, there to be present the equipment the procurement of everything you need the rigorous methodology and then uh, enough people for participating so it feels like i flattened out the way and then really so often it happened to me that my students were sitting at the project and doing this kind of stuff that I was actually super interested in. I was like, oh, I would love to do this right now, but I didn't have the time there because I had always several projects to coordinate in parallel. So I was always like this, this kind of even project manager rather than the designer in there. Yeah, yeah, of yeah. course, we gave the feedback and I always tried when we, for example, um, uh, evaluated communication cues for autonomous vehicles. I was also involved, of course, with the concepts, but it was not always this creative work that I took over, but it was like I had to leave this to other yeah. people and do boring tasks. But I felt from the very first project, I, I experienced that this was necessary in order to ensure a success in the project. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think it's a matter of, in a way, sacrifices. I mean, uh, <clears throat> I suppose you're not that alone and you see your own, uh, your own product coming alive and that is also a different kind of reward. Uh, yes. Right. So that's yep. uh, that's it. One thing that I also wanted to ask you in this case, we or very often what people associate is uh, VR is the final outcome, right? VR is the experience. Is is the is the thing that the users put the headset and goes through and you get feedback from. 
But are there moments where you could use, for example, VR more to do design as a tool for design? Mm -hmm. right? Because I think that there is this, I mean, it's not even a misconception. Is that how it is, right? People think about VR and they think about, okay, I am, uh, uh, VR is the experience I put on. But have you ever used VR as a tool to actually craft something? Yes. Actually, this Friday, I will present a paper in a conference, in a dr VR driving simulator conference, um, where we use that as well. And also in a design conference that is in October, uh, a project where we um, created a VR prototyping tool, where we first uh, analyzed other VR prototyping tools as well as desktop based CAD tools to figure out what kind of basic functionality you need in order to have um, a VR prototyping tool. And it, they are great tools, don't get me wrong here, but I think they are uh, very suitable for creative faces for visualizing ideas in a more interactive way. But at the point we are right now, I would not consider them, for example, for CAD work. Yeah. So if you need to, to create, for example, a vehicle with class A surfaces, VR for now is the wrong tool for you because you don't have this accuracy. Yeah. It is like when, when you when you are shivering a little, then you have this tremor in, in the uh, concepts as well. So there you need, I think, for now, a desktop, a mouse, a computer, yeah, yeah. whatever. But for this creative phase of doing things of communicating ideas that is also very interesting it is super interesting uh, also to share this um not even more people in vr which of course can also work but very people standing on the computer and seeing what another person in vr does can also trigger creativity there i see a huge benefit for it but not yet for the CAD work. Yeah, so let me just do one thing. Uh, there is Laurent uh, Danise says, where can we find your paper, please? Please. Oh yeah, so um, <laughs> all of my papers are uh, at my page in ResearchGate. Um, of course, with some copyright thingies, I may not um, share them uh, openly, but if people um, uh, ask me and, and approach me, of course, uh, I, can, I can send them the personal uh so documents. to the people just asking you right now to the people that subscribes to this uh can i share your email so that they could ask you directly uh about yeah the of paper? course okay. share okay. share the email not a problem at so, all if you have any questions if you want to discuss of course i'm always open yeah. to to other opinions and also as we had our discussion several days ago um always fruitful and always interesting to talk to people with other experiences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, shortly, Laurent, to answer your question, you're going to get the email from uh, Sebastian directly and he can send you there uh, after, at the end of this, probably in a couple of hours after we are done. Um, and then you're going to get the paper. I do have one thing now. So you mentioned fruitful discussion. And here it's like, I don't want to sound bad, but you mentioned because VR, it's not made for CAD work, right? I believe VR is not made for, for example, uh, final animation production. I believe VR is not made for final sculpting. Should be. My feeling is not. And, and I might go against people because I know that there are a lot of people that they would like to put the headset on and go from the beginning until the end and just and just basically finish the whole project and do the same thing that they've done in, uh, for example, Grasshopper. Uh, I know there are some of the uh, software, yeah, or maybe it could be 3ds Max, or maybe it could be Unity, or maybe it could whatever. Do we want to, or do we expect for VR to provide the same level of depth that a final 2D tools is going to provide and to provide final production or not? What's your take on this? And I already told you, my answer is no, but tell, tell me yours. Yeah. And actually at this point, I also like to ask the people that are online, what's your take on this? Because I think when it's about creating, uh, using a virtual reality, uh, this is a very important question because that's going to shape how these products in the future are going to come up on the market. So what's your take? Should oh, VR yeah, be um, made for final production? But in meanwhile, Sebastian. So, so difficult to answer, in my opinion, because should also gives a direction already, right? Um, I think the software developers are pushing in this direction because that's the next logical step to have it in. 
So right now they have it for, let's say, a little more than fun, right? It's not just fun anymore to mm -hmm. uh, create the primitives and show things, but they want to get to a serious product uh, or a serious software to sell. And maybe they feel the need, the urge to therefore go as far as possible with accuracy of models. Because in the end, if you create a volume model, you're going to produce it in, in some certain ways, right? And it is already used in design reviews for uh, OEMs in uh, uh, automotive industry. So um, BMW, Audi, they use it already in their product, product development, but not in the creation, but in the review process, where people mm -hmm. then could see the vehicles yeah, in okay. environments, one-to-one yeah. -one scale, but not in this, okay, I'm going to um, draw, draw the car now. Um, should it be there? I, I don't know if it should be there. Can it be there? I also don't know. Um, right now, for sure not. Um, especially because of this accuracy, as we as we discussed you know, earlier. You know, I, 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 here I want to say one thing. Because I'm not sure that it's a problem about accuracy. You know, when you are, so if you look at the interface about a standard 3D program, right? I, I mean, like, uh, uh, for example, let's pick Unity, right? How many icons do you see at the same time? How many submenus? I mean, those are things that in VR just don't work. I mean, in VR, you cannot have 10,000 submenus. You cannot click that. And I don't think they should. Now, if, I, if we, should we? And I think, no, but you know why? Because if you look at, how, for example, how the web evolved, right? Let's imagine. So we were 20, 25 years ago, right? The, the website were, were terrible, uh, were just bad. They didn't work. The experience was bad. And what happened? Because, because they were made by developers. Right? So developers were there and they were crafting all their codes and they were coming up with something functional, yeah. but user experience is a different thing. What happened then? Then what happened that prototyping tools came up, right? You can now do uh, very simply with, with gazillion Adobe XD and, and God knows how many there are, right? And those are tools for designers. Do they allow you to make the final website? No, they don't. And they shouldn't, I think, because we should give designer the designer tool and we should give the developers developer tools. And they should talk to each other Absolutely. I think there should be a way for them to communicate because that's where I think also very often things go wrong. Uh, but yeah, I think that, that and that is my take. And uh, again, my, my other people might, might actually disagree. So um, what I see here is it depends a little on the on the industry you're working in. Um, I was working in a startup for, for a couple of years and there we had a product that we developed and it was not a high complex uh, product that we did there. And therefore I did this, um, the, the engineering part behind it, because of course I also learned this kind of stuff. And um, as you might know, Rhino, for example, is a CAD tool. Mm -hmm. It is very different from SOLIDWORKS, but if you really know the software, you can prepare volumes that can be 3D printed. You can um, make um, injection molding, uh, whatever, if you know the tool correctly. And therefore, there is not always necessary this exchange to, to the engineers to develop it if it is uh, not that complex uh, uh, project or product that's made. But I agree with you that maybe VR does not need to get there. What I like to see, what I find very interesting, though, is um, one of the biggest advantages you have in there right now is, in my opinion, the one-to-one -one scale. And for me, if I would use it right now, I would still use desktop-based CAD, but it is so interesting to see it then what the one-to-one -one scale is, for example. So I did one project, for example, where we had a um, 3D printed uh, um, a small product and it was out of selective um, laser sintering. So it's very accurate. And in my Rhino, I always had it this big, of course, and I was uh, 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 making class A surfaces as good as possible here, a gem for their radius and blah. And then the, we, we ordered this thing. And it came back and it was a tiny, tiny piece. <laughs> and you lose this kind of scale yeah. just working in front of your screen in this CAD. And then jumping into VR and seeing that this is actually this tiny. Yeah. I could have saved a lot of working hours knowing, okay, no one's going to see this chamfer that I put in there. And maybe even the machine cannot produce it anymore. The other way around, if you have a vehicle in CAD, it's always this small or you just have this kind of um, um, details there having the one-to-one -one scale is very yeah, advantageous yeah, yeah, in yeah. my opinion and there i see yeah. a great benefit um, about 
should it be a CAD tool itself, we are, I, I, yeah, yeah. I can't say for now. Maybe I in 10 years, it's very different. Yo, you know, of course, of course, it's going to be, technology is going to evolve and we're going to have other problems. And uh, one thing that there is, Marcus says, and now it's uh, this like going wild because he asks, speculate. What's missing in terms of software tools, method, education today that would enable more researcher or normal people or almost anybody to run these prototypes by themselves. Mm -hmm. so, and here we're going back, right? So here we're going back not to the idea of creating using VR, but like creating something, right, by yourself um, and putting people in it. So we are talking again about testing, about uh, or about communicating this idea with this kind of immersive prototypes. I imagine. Experiences, yeah. so to say. Yeah. So going yeah. back, what's missing in terms of software tools or education to allow almost anybody to start doing it today? That's a great question. Um, so for the education, I mean, it always depends on who's the user in the end and what is the profession of the user. Um, because it also then gives like the education, right? If you are a engineer or a software developer, you already have quite a lot of knowledge yeah. in this certain field. No, I of think programming. Marcus, Marcus already points like, let's say it's nobody. Let's say that I'm a designer that I have no education, a bit of okay. like maybe mm -hmm. you, and I want to create something like this, what would be yeah. missing? Yeah, okay. So because as a designer, I would say the education is missing exactly to, to okay. speak the language, to have like this basic knowledge. But also let's say I'm a, whatever, I'm a teacher and now I want to yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, make a VR uh, experience. So in, it's it's a very, very small, not a small, but a, a small range because on the one hand, you want to create a very unique scenario, a unique experience, which means you have to define a lot of things. But on the other hand, I would say what is missing is an easy tool to create these uh, uh, scenarios. I tried myself with Unity, um, and I have to admit here, Unity is a very rewarding software. So you don't have to code in the in the beginning. There's a lot of pre-written scripts. There is a lot of mods you can put in, and you already have a huge success rate. There are good YouTube channels and, and stuff like that to, to ex have yes, these basic scenarios, right? But you will come to, to this, this threshold, to this uh, edge very shortly, I would say, but it is not sufficient anymore what you want to have and what you're able to create. And then it immediately starts to um, needing to, to have this competency of uh, C Sharp, C++, programming, JavaScript, whatever, to put that in. Exactly, exactly this. And this is where I stopped. Yeah, I did my first scenarios how to... Uh, uh, load a environment to VR, how to use a player in VR, and blah, blah, blah. This all worked. But then if you say, I want to have this, 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 and if I do this in the environment, something else, so this, this if uh, uh, loops, it already starts to get a little more complex. And what I feel is missing is um, a tool that, that makes it easy and, and takes away the fear of jumping into this cold pool of programming. Like, make it make it gradually make it with a library where you have um, a little like grasshopper you made it you, you mentioned it beforehand maybe you have some boxes that give like interactions and you can connect them and not having to program maybe it is then a simplified interaction in the beginning but maybe this takes away the fear of jumping into it learning the logic behind it and maybe then people would uh uh, would feel confident to go a step beyond and then really programming, programming, programming with it. So it looks something like a modular system, something that guides to do the basic. And I think, you know, it has also to do a lot with expectation, uh, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, so what, what does it mean? I mean, it means that when people go in, sometimes they expect to create these real things, but I think it has to do with educate them. Look, you don't need that. I mean, to create a prototypes, I mean, prototypes are made of paper, are made of Lego bricks, right? So why now when you go in VR, you hear these people, oh yeah, but the shadows are not realistic. Like, what are you saying? I mean, we, yeah. we are doing this on, on, on a desktop with some puppets and that works. Why wouldn't work differently? But if instead of like high polygons, one million, polygons worth of car there is just maybe a 1000 car because they are, it's the idea of having a car there 
So yeah. I think one thing is really about up looking at this. So this is a prototype. What you're trying to get is, is an answer. And consequently, you don't want to do the production. So the, you don't want to go to Unity maybe necessarily. You need something that, because with Unity, they produce AAA games. I mean, games yeah. that when you put the headset on, you get lost. So is yes. that what you want? I don't think you want, because how much does it cost to make a AAA game? Is that exactly. a prototype anymore? I, I don't think so. So yeah. I think that first, uh, personally, we should get that off. We should get off our, our, our system, right? If you make a prototype, you want something quick, easy. And I think always people have a hard time understanding that. The thing about the tools, I think I totally agree with you regarding the modularity. So it's something that has pre-built blocks, the minimum that you need in order to have that. Um, uh, the minimum equivalent in order to actually uh, uh, build the MVP of your prototype, let's say. Mm -hmm. But I believe that one, one, one chance there, and then I connect to what I was saying before, is like VR tools to create VR have a chance. And you know why? Because I think if there is one thing that VR does is that it allow to do things that people wouldn't normally do. So for example, it would be almost impossible for someone without any experience to actually create a, 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 a simple scene made of uh, primitives. Impossible. I mean, look, if I give this to my mom, she will be impossible to take Blender and do it. No way. Yeah. But I'm yeah. sure that she would use Google Blocks and I will tell her, look, this is your grab. This is your put. This is your change color. She's going, she will be able to do it. Mm -hmm. So what's in there? I think that there is this hint where using VR tools lower the barrier of entry to do a certain level of production that is good enough for design creativity. Do you want to bring it to the end? Then at some point you need to take that, put it somewhere else and keep working on it. But I think that, and, and tools like this, I mean, there is Gravity Sketch, there is uh, Tvori that allows you to uh, animate and create scene, share them with people. Uh, and uh, I mean, Google Blocks, Tilt Brush, uh, I mean, there are many uh, and that are very accessible. And this, I think, what, what would be needed in order to allow really to create these this, this prototypes uh, personally. So I think it's a matter of my mindset, education, and trying to build the right tool Try to build those tools that with kind of like 20% of the time, you can do 80% of the job. Exactly, yeah. Because the rest is going to take you a lot of time. And that's how it is, right? Because the, the, all the fine polishing. But maybe you don't need to have this whole thing done completely in order to, to, to do that. So I mean, it depends on your expectations then in the end. If exactly. you want to use it as a tool for visualizing and communicating your ideas, um, totally fine. But maybe it is not fine anymore if it goes beyond so this th this step is very difficult to grasp where yeah. it is yeah 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 and marcus also asked uh, maybe something that, that could be uh, also ask you and i'll answer first and maybe you can answer uh, or at least what's my take on it uh, marcus asked what's the equivalent of shitty first draft for vr I mean, for me, I think, <laughs> <laughs> right, it, it's, it's a good point. I mean, when you make a prototype, right, it could be made, for example, to communicate an idea, yep. right? And I mean, shitty first draft at that stage, for me, could be just this, right? If you want to communicate an idea and get people to an experience, if you get just a 360 video going and you put them in, it could just be enough. So if you are able to make a 360 video with a VR tools, I mean, it might just be enough, I feel. Yep. If you want to communicate how, for example, ch things slightly change uh, after there is some sort of interaction of how uh, the space, again, then maybe you need something more advanced, uh, I believe. So again, I mean, it's not, it's uh, one of the, one of the, you know, uh, answer that makes nobody happy, but it depends. It depends yeah. on what's the purpose of the prototypes. I don't know what's, what's your take on that. So, um, also not that easy to answer in my opinion, because the shitty first draft very frequently used in, in, in design. It is really something you don't even try to make a nice sketch out of it, but it's like, it, it normally it's looking horrible. Yeah? <laughs> but the good thing is it is very easy. It is very clear. It is very quick and you can communicate this idea to other people and they won't judge how good of a drawing God you are, but they get the idea you have yeah. behind it. And we use that all the time. And, um, 
I did not use it in VR yet, but these criteria that I just mentioned, they would have to be there in my opinion. And um, as a designer, you always have your pen and your paper in front of you and do this. I think there is still a huge gap to bridge for VR to be this accessible to people, to be able to be a tool for the first shitty sketch. Yeah, yeah, I think there is. And you know what is the problem is that, <laughs> and then I have a question about from Daniela that is asking about visual scripting. I don't know if you have any experience with that. Um, but uh, um, one thing is, you know what happens is that so far all these tools are coming in the hand of developers very, very often. And as such, what they do, well, why am I going to use this? I mean, I could do that as well as Unity. And what happens is that this just slows down the development of these tools because they don't get in my opinion, the feedback from the people that should actually use them, right? So, I mean, this is, if you are asking to someone to create something with using VR as a tool, right? I would expect it to be quick, creative, not very polished, or maybe uh, go more in the early stage of development and of concepting, uh, and not at the end. Um, but right now, this word is made of, of a lot of developers. Right, in within companies that are, and, and they are like, yeah, what am I gonna do this? I can do this well, as much, even better. Uh, you, I, I know, but this is not for you. And so consequently, yeah. I will never, well, people will never get the real feedback to actually start building for the designers because they never see these tools because they, they yeah. are just, uh, they are just busy sketching or doing maybe their own work and they don't get exposed to it. And that's, I think, that's, I think that's a huge shame for the designer and for the people that are trying to design this tool at the same time. Yeah, 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 very true. So what about, uh, do you have instead, have you ever done visual scripting instead? Would that, was that good enough to introduce those kind of like interactions uh, and, and stuff in, in Unity? Because he mentioned about Blueprint in a real engine or Bolt. I don't know in Unity. I don't know if you use that. Or... I I, um, I tried some tutorials there, and also with visual scripting, yes, um, but also to a certain degree um, because you have these uh, very basic interactions that you also can um, design with them works quite well. But for us, it was already um, it was getting so complex within a minute because always, uh, always we used our, um, we, we made an experiment there. It was our transport system, our bus in Singapore as with, with a traffic simulation, with pedestrian simulations. It, it, it became so complex within minutes, let's say, um, that, that I would not have jumped on this train to say, I try it myself. I tried it more to be able to, to communicate, to know, okay, what does this developer now want what is his or her opinion about it what is the the struggle there mm. that i can help from a methodological uh, uh, viewpoint but not that i would uh, jump right in for myself but it was also quite rewarding i would say because you can achieve a lot of things without um a lot of education beforehand therefore yeah. it is a good basis in my opinion but then w w question right so when you were there simulating traffic or pedestrians uh how would that really work? Were you in, in adding parameters or you were creating maybe one or two scenario? And about those, were they changing in time or were fixed? Right? So maybe like it, it, where did people started, for example, like in one way and then based on something that the user was doing, yep. react? How, how, how was the, the whole thing built? Yeah, uh, it, it depends, of course, on the, on the scenario that we had in there. What we tried to do is to develop a huge platform um, that is actually working as a city simulation ah, and you okay. can then jump in and if you have a new case study you use this part of your city simulation mm. and you can do whatever you want therefore what is important what was important to us was um to not have let's say scripted um volumes that move around on a time axis but more like um for example in unity you have nav mesh where you have like a certain area that is um free for 3d agents to walk along and they go from point A to point B. When they reach point B, they go to point C. And therefore, you have it more autonomous, this whole system. Mm -hmm. Of course, you have to be um, cautious. As soon as you have a simulation, 
nothing is scripted anymore and therefore if you collect data in a scientific experiment maybe these simulations already alter the environment and the data collection because yeah. maybe your behavior is triggered by a pedestrian that is crossing the zebra crossing in front of you and for the next participant maybe this person is not mm -hmm. there and there it gets very tricky with the with the design of the study that actually having this kind of simulations uh, we wanted to to save some work for future projects having this whole system available. yeah 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 then then it makes sense it makes sense and again right it's purpose dependent so i can yeah. imagine that if it, this is something that is part of a bigger project having something where you can kind of like plug change a parameter about the flow or about speed or about time of day then they, those are things that are gonna come exactly. in handy. Yeah. And, and we knew like, okay, the city works uh, like let's say 80% for the new scenario that we have. And when we tried it out and saw like, okay, there's some flaws with the traffics or with the, with the simulations, then of course you start altering. Or even then we did it that at one point we threw out the simulation again and put in scripted vehicles because we had to have exactly the same constellation for every participant. That's then this revising work we had afterwards. Clear, clear, clear. And one question about, so I suppose that you know a lot of industrial designer, right? Maybe someone that uh, done PhD with you or maybe uh, uh, colleagues. Uh, do you feel that designers kind of like, what's their perception of VR? How do they how do they look at it? Do they I don't know how do they look at it? I have my own pre, I have my own thinking, but I, I'm curious about what what's your take on that? Um, I would say even though VR is uh, around quite quite long already, right? Um, I think that it is perceived as a very new and um, interesting technology, but also intimidating. Um, exactly out of the same reason as beforehand we cannot create a VR experience very easily. So I think more and more um, industrial designers or designers um, know it is there, it is available, and there are certain case studies where it is super su uh, suitable for it. But still, it is not at the point where people say, it is part of our design method toolbox. It is one of, I mean, uh, you know, IDEO, maybe it's one of the very big yes. design uh, mm -hmm. consultancies. They have a toolbox, the, the IDEO method cards. Mm -hmm. There are 50 cards and each card is a method and they um, show how you can use it in certain situations. And I think VR is not there yet to be part of this method toolbox <laughs> because it's not accessible, not, not this accessible. It has to be for a designer. So it is also, I think it's the same development as we had it with the CAD. CAD was introduced for, for industrial designers in the late 80s, in the beginning yeah, of yeah, 90s. Yeah. Beforehand, everything was in sketching. Technical drawings were made uh, manually yeah, and, and analog. And I think we are on this, on this edge, on this threshold right now, where it needs to have a little more accessibility that the industrial designers see, oh, it is actually part of my toolbox and I can use it. And also the curriculum in the education has to change in this direction. Um, they, they, they learn how to use CAD software. Why don't they learn also how can I use VR in the different stages of the design process? Yeah. Because you can uh, combine almost every normal design method or even say data collection method with VR. It doesn't have to be necessarily a method just for designers, it can be anything. I mean, yeah. I did usability testing and usability testing is not a design method, it's a data collection method, it's an evaluation yeah. method. And if you have this toolbox, then I think it, it can be triggered that a standard industrial designer in X years can use VR for his or her data collection. I agree, I agree. And I think testing is one of the trickiest part because when it's about exploring and it's about communicating, I think we might be there. Testing, I agree. It's not there and I think there is a lot of awareness and a lot of feedback needed from guys like you and other people that face this obstacle to come back. I want to just go back one second because Marcus asked another question. Uh, can, can you elaborate on the analysis of your research data from test subject, looking at observations and interview? So what came out of those tests? Hmm, okay. I, I, that's how I would interpret. Can you elaborate the analysis of your research data from test subject? So I would say more, more or less that, that would be the so it's, it's difficult now because I have like six or seven studies that I did there. Okay. Um, and we always collect a different kind of data, but I can give a, a very brief summary. So 
um, we observed how long people needed to cross a road when an autonomous vehicle is approaching. So quantitative data there, the, the time of, of uh, moving, then the speed, the walking speed, also error rates, how often did participants make an error in, in this uh, okay. environment. Then let me, let me just do one thing. So what was the real advantage? Was there any real advantage of using VR with regards to the data that were collected? Because that's, I feel, the direction that, that Marcus wanted, because he's asking about observations and interview. So when you, was there an actual value in doing this? Have you seen people behaving as you expected, maybe even? Of course we did that, yes. Uh, not expected, but as we hoped for, of course. Okay. Uh, okay. You, yeah. you yeah. always try to, to uh, see a direction of your research question. And even if it's uh, a falsification, I was also happy yeah? because you answered yes, the question. That's, that's yeah. the reason of research, not uh, confirming to your question, your, yeah. but, but um, prove it. Yeah. Um, Yes, I mean, we, we hoped for observations. We, we got observations uh, that we did not expect at all. Okay. We had one scenario where we let people be overrun by, the, by an autonomous vehicle on mm -hmm. purpose. And there were people that were just laughing at it. They were like, ha, 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 how, how funny. And we tested afterwards their experience with gaming. And that was interesting because um, people with a high experience with gaming prior to the experiment tended to show less realistic realistic there again realistic reactions and my personal belief is um i i talk i, I say it very slow it is like when you play counter strike every day for an hour and you good headshot uh, you are not surprised if you're overrun by a vehicle anymore but if you have a person who never even played that or has no experience with gaming at all and then you, you are immersed in a realistic looking environment. And the vehicle yes. is, yes, we had people, they were jumping out of the way, always uh, 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 ripped off the cable of the equipment. And afterwards we conducted uh, interviews with these people. And especially this one person said, it was almost like a near death experience. It was so real and uh, he did not ex expect it this way. And this showed us, okay, it was really like as if this person would be in there. And of course, um, with this data collection, we always um, followed up with the interview, just not to see the, the sole observations or the, yeah, the, the behaviors, yeah. but also to question why. Why did you, did you do exactly this? What happened? And this also always uh, uh, was interesting for the lessons learned and, of course, for the follow-up projects to see, okay, why was it now a real scenario for this person and why was it not a real scenario for the other person? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. Does this answer the question? I, I, I think I think it, it certainly does. And, I mean, I think that also if there is more about that uh, and more about how the tests were done and what kind of observations specifically yeah. for the different cases, I think that that's why the articles are the best way. And I think sometimes also the abstract in a nutshell and the conclusion just give enough exactly. uh, of, yes. of that view. And, I mean, this also poses a whole other problem, right? I mean, like... How is, how is the bias of the person that is going to put the headset on is going to influence the research positively or negatively, right? And uh, I mean, you want someone that is maybe is somehow experienced sometimes with VR, maybe have done it before because he can move more uh, swiftly in the environment, perform tasks better. But the one that maybe have never experienced it are the ones that are more virgin. Yeah. But on the other hand, are they going to be in awe and oh wow, this is so good, or oh, and consequently just be a false, false test, yeah. right? Yeah. So this is this is another level of complexity yeah. that I think that, it's, that's uh, that's super complex, but also super interesting. And what absolutely. we did in the end is um, we tried to have a homogeneous distribution. Um, that we say we want to have people without any experience in VR. We even had a look with the uh, gaming experience, but also with people with high experience. And we always measured if there are any correlations, if there are um, significant differences in their in, in the collected data, let's say, because yeah, yeah, it wasn't yeah. always uh, quantifiable. So we always did that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, Sebastian, we have a couple more minutes. So if you would have a suggestion to people that would like to start experimenting with this from a designer, maybe they want to start to look in like, okay, I'm here, I, w I want to do my own, I want to start exploring this. 
right? Yeah. And they are not developers, but they are more from designers or maybe someone that is trying to figure out a problem or maybe do user testing in a different way. What kind of advice would you would you give them? Um, I would start with don't be afraid. Don't okay. fear <laughs> it. Don't, don't be intimidated because, as I said beforehand, in the beginning it is quite quite rewarding to do so don't start with buying yourself a high-end uh, render computer or uh, the HTC Vive Pro or whatever start with Google Cardboard everyone has a smartphone at hand and these are the perfect devices for accessible VR experiences you don't need to have a six degree of freedom set before you start mm -hmm. developing your first uh, uh, experience in VR so start from the basis and start with simple tasks. So, um, of course, if you want to have interactive things, it already gets more complicated. But throwing in an environment and looking around on your on your uh, device is, is so cool. We did that the first time. Uh, we opened our app. We had the Google Cardboard. We looked around, and it's like, okay, this is what I did right now, and this was super super nice. Yeah. And I think with this, you can step by step um, proceed and gathering these experiences that you need in order to use VR frequently. But the first thing is, yeah, try it out. I, I can almost certainly uh, promise you that you won't fail with it. Yeah, if you don't, of course, over exceed your expectations. Yes, exactly. And I think that at, even at that level, even at being able to show an idea, show a space that could already add value. It, it's just the first step and that could already add value. And yeah. personally, I believe that what's what also is like trying to look, if you have a headset yourself, I think that start looking into VR tools to create stuff. It's just the easiest way right now to jump in. And I could come up with a list that is, as I said, Tvori, Google Blocks, yeah. Field Brush, yeah. Gravity Sketch. I mean, there is a long list and already with that, you can start creating something that you would never be able to, to, to start doing within the same amount of time on 2D tools because forget yes. about learning Blender in one afternoon. I'm sure Google yeah. Blocks you, you can start you creating do. stuff <laughs> in one afternoon, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. you want to, it's true, yeah. Sebastian, I want to thank you very, very much for uh, for this very insightful chat. And uh, we are going to send the articles, uh, send your contacts so that people can get directly the uh, articles from you. And maybe if they are curious, they have other questions. Uh, I also wanted to thank Everybody that joined that asked questions, uh, it was it was really uh, really appreciated, and I think it was a very good conversation. Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, it was super nice talking to you. Also, the uh, user questions and feedback um, was quite interesting talking about these aspects. I'm also gonna watch the video again to see the the comments. I'm quite curious yes. about that. Um, yeah, it was really really happy being here. Thank you very much. Absolutely, Sebastian. Then uh, have a good day and. Uh, uh, Let's see what uh, the other people come up with regards to the question. Yes, thank you very much. Bye bye, Sebastian. <laughs> bye bye. bye, -bye. So, we 